you can think about it as a signing mechanism that is controlled by both the user and a massively decentralized network, which is the Para network. You can have a protocol on Ethereum, for example, and that protocol can determine whether or not a Bitcoin signature is generated. And it can determine whether or not a SUI transaction is generated. It always also needs the user to consent. So it can't by itself just create the transaction. But if you have, for example, a protocol that wants to allow users to exchange native BTC and native SUI, and you want that protocol to live on Ethereum, then that protocol can use Para Network in order to enforce the logic of the swap, in order to have an atomic swap of native assets without having to bridge them and without having to wrap them directly from a smart contract on Ethereum. I'm sitting with David. It's just the day before Token 2049. We're so pumped and ready to go. But before we do that tomorrow, we have the opportunity to discuss Parachain and learn more about it. David, before we jump into it, could you tell me a bit more about yourself, your background, and how you transitioned from Web 2 to Web 3? What was the journey there? Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, so I've been an entrepreneur for the past 15 years. Um, I, uh, I did a lot of different things in, in many different industries, from culture and museums to AI and cybersecurity. Uh, my last company was an AI company that I founded with Omer Sadika, who also co-founded Para with me. Um, in general, um, myself, Omer, and Jonathan, our third co-founder, uh, and also a lot of our team members, we have um, extensive uh, experience with um, cybersecurity, deep tech, AI. Uh, Omer previously founded a cybersecurity unicorn. Um, and, uh, and a lot of our team uh, are expert researchers um, in cryptography, some PhDs, uh, some world-renowned PhDs as well. Um, and uh, this is kind of the, the background we come from. I think for me, the transition from Web 2 to Web 3 was pretty easy. So um, I've been personally interested in, in, um, in Web 3 for a long time. I haven't built anything in Web 3 until we started Para. But uh, for me, Web3 is, is cybersecurity. Um, so the whole concept of blockchain is to allow users to interact with each other without trusting any intermediaries, any third parties. And blockchain uses cryptography in order to do that. And that is all really connected to the world of cybersecurity um, and how to make things in a way that can be trusted in a trustless way, right? How can I trust the protocol? How do I make sure the protocol is secure? Um, and I think it's there are a lot of very interesting kind of thought experiments in cybersecurity that blockchain kind of made real. And they're not thought experiments anymore. And I think that's super exciting. And it's also a pretty seamless and natural transition, I think, for all of our team that is uh, coming mostly from cybersecurity. Yeah, and could you tell me a bit more about her uh, network? We are talking about it, and it's like a new cryptographic primitive that builds the zero trust broker. Yeah. Uh, I'm just throwing some fancy words there, yeah. but could you uh, explain that to me as like I'm a five years old because it's quite complex. Absolutely, I'll try. I don't know if it'll be five, but uh, <laughs> but I'll try <laughs> to get it as close as possible to five. <laughs> um, so yeah, we can go back to like the basics of blockchain. Like blockchain started with Bitcoin, and to this day, Bitcoin is like one of the most compelling ideas in blockchain because it's so simple and it's so powerful and it stands on this premise of never having to trust anyone right never having to trust a third party like being able to transact and interact and create a monetary system without having any trust and any reliance on any third parties um, a lot of people think that for example miners in in bitcoin or validators in ethereum you like you need to trust them and if they collude they can steal your assets but that's not true like the whole point of blockchain is that even the miners and even the validators are not trusted and this is this is what we call zero trust so you never have to trust a third party and an intermediary and you can always verify the entire state of the blockchain and uh, always make sure that all of the transactions are signed with a private key so um, this is kind of the basic most powerful premise of blockchain which I think kind of created this whole like vision and amazing industry that, that we have today and the problem started when you, you had more and more blockchains. Each one of them was completely zero trust by itself. But then when you wanted to 
sorry, before we yeah. move to that part, sorry, I have, yeah, I have a question about the trust. Sorry. So do you think the trust, especially within the Bitcoin community, and now I think in Ethereum is deteriorating because in Bitcoin, we have comparatively high mining requirements. So before people could mine Bitcoin, you know the argument and know where that's going. We see the same with like with the validators of on Ethereum. Yeah. So there are some issues to it being a validator. It's quite challenging. Yeah. You need 32 eats. Um, so do you think that there's some centralization even within this two yeah. major? I think that's a really good question. And that's a really great way to kind of crystallize the difference between centralization and trust. And these are two different things. So zero trust means that as a user, I can always verify and never have to trust anyone. And no one can determine the state without me. This is what it means. Now, it's true that it's better if the state is also managed by a de the, the most decentralized set possible, right? That is al always better. But still, even if you have a very, very centralized set, blockchain is based on zero trust. And so even if you would have five validators on Ethereum, you still don't trust these five validators. It's not that if you have 100,000 validators, now you, you, it's easier to trust them. You never trust them. It doesn't matter. So we always want to have things more decentralized, but it doesn't matter how centralized or decentralized it is. If it is zero trust, it's zero trust. And if you have to trust them, you have to trust them. And it's, it's very, it's like a binary. Hey. Yeah. So um, I think uh, like as a segue from that, um, if we're uh, looking at the way that people try to solve interoperability, that's a very hard problem to solve with zero trust because the moment you need to sync two different states where each one of them is completely zero trust with its own assumptions, you need to have someone to attest for the state of the other chain. And then you need to trust that one, that person, or that group of persons. It doesn't matter. Even if it's a thousand different nodes that attest, you still need to trust them. And that's exactly the difference between centralization and trust. So you can have a protocol like Wormhole that currently has 19 guardians, right? You have to trust those 19 guardians. Even if they scale to 19,000 guardians, you will still need to trust those 19,000 guardians. It's, it doesn't like, it's obviously better if it's decentralized, but it's still on the binary of trust versus zero trust. That's on the trust side. And this is a very hard problem to solve. And, and our goal when we started the company uh, almost three years ago was to solve exactly this problem. And we did extensive cryptography research to create... Sorry, before we yeah, move yeah. to that, uh, yeah, I completely agree with it. And thank you so much for outlining it because I now understand. I mean, I've always been struggling with the issue of like centralization, but it's not necessarily inherently bad. It's the trust part that you don't have visibility to this centralized equity uh, entities that could be particularly bad. Yeah, uh, it, but it's, before, by the way, it's more than visibility, right? It's who determines the state, right? Yeah, yeah, so, control. Yeah, so in, in Ethereum, every user can run a full node. It doesn't have to be a validator. And you can reconstruct the state yourself from Genesis. And you have the, the chain of blocks that are connected, right, with the hash of the previous block. And every block has valid signatures that were signed with private keys. And if the validators try to change the state, they try to put in a, a transaction that wasn't signed, you can immediately verify that that's not a valid transaction and just exclude it from the calculation of the state. So you never have to trust the validators to give you the state. You can always calculate it. With Wormhole, for example, right? And it's not just Wormhole, it's every interoperability solution. You have to trust them to give you the state because they control the assets and they control the states. The user essentially is giving them control and trusting that they will act honestly. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. So I feel like we outlined the problem, which is like essentially trust and you being able to verify and validate. Um, could you tell me a bit about yourself? Like what's the solution that you provide to that problem? Sure. So we created this new cryptographic primitive. It's called the D-Wallet. By the way, the Para network used to be called the D-Wallet network, but it confused too many people because they thought we were a, a wallet app or a wallet interface. But it's actually a very low-level infrastructure, a new cryptographic primitive, that you can think about it as a signing mechanism that is controlled by both the user and a massively decentralized network, which is the para network. And that allows you a few things. First of all, it allows you to have zero trust, because if the user is always required to generate a signature, that means that the user doesn't have to trust anyone, right? Because 
if, if you have a signature, that's cryptographic proof that the user approved that signature, right? So that's the zero trust part. Then you have the network part that allows you to create logic and enforce logic. So you can have a zero trust protocol. And a protocol can determine whether or not a signature is generated, like the user. And then only when both the protocol and the user agree, you have a signature generated. So how would that work in reality? You can have a protocol on Ethereum, for example. And that protocol can determine whether or not a Bitcoin signature is generated. And it can determine whether or not a SUI transaction is generated. It always also needs the user to consent. So it can't by itself just create the transaction. But if you have, for example, a protocol that wants to allow users to exchange native BTC and native uh, SUI, and you want that protocol to live on Ethereum, then that protocol can use Para Network in order to enforce the logic of the swap, in order to have an atomic swap of native assets without having to bridge them and without having to wrap them directly from a smart contract on Ethereum. And who is determining on the protocol side? Because on the user side, it's comparatively easy to understand. It's just yeah. a user, have the signature there. But on the protocol side, I'm struggling to understand the dynamic there. So could you just explain it to me? Sure, yeah. So on the protocol side, it's a smart contract. You have a smart contract logic. Let's say that logic is swapping or lending, or maybe it's custody, maybe it's access control. I want, for example, to allow you to spend up to $1,000 a week. So the smart contract on Ethereum will enforce that logic because that's written in the smart contract. And you know as a user that that is trustless, right? The smart contract on Ethereum is trustless. But the problem today with the smart contract on Ethereum is that it can't control assets on Bitcoin. <clears throat> because the moment you want to do, if you take Uniswap, for example, if you want to swap Bitcoin on Uniswap, you need to use WBTC. And then you introduce a trusted third party, a custodian that wraps the BTC. So it, it transforms Uniswap from a zero trust protocol into what we call a castle and moat protocol. Now you have a castle with a moat, a security perimeter, which is the custodian. And once you get past the security perimeter, you can steal all the BTC. And with a zero trust protocol powered by Terra, you're able to interact directly with the Bitcoin network without trusting any bridge and any intermediary. And you said that you're on infrastructure but I feel like I still feel there is a stack. So could you just explain to me where exactly do you fit in the stack? Because while you're talking in my head, I feel like you're com competing with companies that provide some form of bridging. So could you explain that and elaborate on that point a little bit further? Yeah. So I think it, it, uh, there, there are two different uh, ways to answer this. First of all, Para is very low level infrastructure and it can be used, for example, to create alternative solutions to bridges, but it can also be used for many other things. It can be used, for example, to create a decentralized version of Fireblocks. It can be used in order to create a marketplace for multi-chain assets, like imagine trading your entire wallet. Uh, imagine trading locked assets, right? Vested assets, soulbound tokens, right? You can trade your entire account. You can use this new primitive in a lot of different ways. Um, so this is like one way to think about it. This is very low-level infrastructure. If we think about it from where it fits in the stack, then you can think about it in a similar way to something like Chainlink. So Chainlink is like an external network. It provides a certain service. And in Chainlink's example, that's like price feeds from Oracle. Um, but then you, you utilize that within your smart contract on, on Ethereum or on Solana or wherever you want to use it. And Terra is, is kind of the same. It has its own network that provides this value of zero trust de-wallet signatures. And you can utilize that within your smart contract in whatever way you choose. Like you can choose how to use that functionality. And could you explain the stakeholders within the ecosystem and who, who is essentially using it? Because I, I assume that's builders, yeah. uh, but what are the main stakeholders? So we're mostly focused on builders. Um, we're we're pretty much chain agnostic. So we're not, uh, we don't have our own smart contract, so you don't have to come and build on our network, but we actually expand the capabilities of existing smart contract networks. We already announced partnerships with multiple um, L1s and L2s like Sui and Monad and Aptos and Celo and Avail and uh, Espresso and Secret, and we're gonna announce a native network and we're gonna announce a few more. Um, and the idea is that every builder, no matter where they build, 
will be able to access any asset on Web3 without introducing new trust assumptions into the process. And just a final question uh, before the interview, you're telling me that you've already launched Testnet and you're planning to launch Mainnet in Q4. Yeah. Could you tell me a bit more about it? And are you planning to introduce a token? What will be the utility of it? Yeah. Uh, just the TLDR. Yeah, sure. So yeah, we launched Testnet. We already have quite a few people that are building um, pretty interesting and cool stuff utilizing this new tech that just enables new use cases. Um, and uh, yeah, there will be a mainnet launch and the token will have a, the, sorry, the, the network will have a token to pay for gas fees, essentially because it is a, a completely decentralized network. Uh, in order to use it and to generate the signature for the D wallet, you will just have to pay gas fee. Um, so it's a model very similar to Ethereum or, or Chainlink that we mentioned. Um, so yeah, there will be a token and uh, it'll, the launch will coincide with the mainnet launch. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you for having me. We should definitely stay in touch. Thank I'll you very much. I'd love to have you on the podcast when you launch the mainnet. Absolutely. Discuss nice it further. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.